We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back. So today we uh, have a return guest, one of our favorite pollsters, uh, Kristen Soltis Anderson. Kristen, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me. So um, it does feel like you weren't on that long ago, but it, but it has been a pretty long time. Um, I don't even know what the uh, actual date was, but it's a couple of years. We've had 2022 elections since then. We've had, from my perspective, I, I think interesting shifts in, in support for leader of the party. You know, the post-2022 election seemed like a ton of momentum for DeSantis. Seems like that's completely non-existent at the moment. You've had um, some recent statewide elections um, that, that, that people took different lessons from. So, I mean, we have plenty, plenty to talk about. Uh, I'm not even sure where to begin, maybe with the 22 election, so you, or maybe even with what you do and why polling matters and why this kind of data matters and what it even tells us. Maybe a little political science nerd them for, sure. for half well, a second. Sure, I'll start there because I know a lot of people, it, it used to be like a decade ago, I would tell people I worked as a pollster and they would say like, oh, that's pretty cool, yeah. tell me about it. And now if I say that, people go... Ew. Well, ugh, well yeah. you, you guys, A, polled, I never get polled. Poll, who takes yeah. poll, you know, and that's all valid. Um, but I think what's really important about polling and why it matters, first of all, polling is not as broken as you think. You know, mm-hmm. the 2022 midterms should not have really been a surprise to anyone the yeah. way they turned out. Um I think a lot of people were kind of mentally looking at polls and saying, oh, well, they undercounted Republicans last time, so maybe they're undercounting them again. Yeah. And they didn't. You the know. Polls were pretty accurate, I think. Which doesn't more, mean that more, we'll be perfect this time around, yeah. but for 2022, they, they were okay. So while there are valid concerns about are the polls accurate or not, and we could talk about that for hours, uh, I do think the 2022 midterms were a sign like, in some ways it's kind of miraculous that we still get it as good as we do. But the other criticism about polling isn't about accuracy, but it's about like, what's the point of it in a democracy? Mm -hmm. Um, That in general, to what extent are these polls pushing a narrative? Are they encouraging people to vote for someone or not vote for someone? Or, Mm -hmm. you know, what value do they provide? And what I think is valuable about them is that in a democracy, we have a couple different ways that people can make their voice heard. You can contact your congressman, you can show up at a town hall, you can show up at a rally, you can write an op-ed in your local newspaper, but a lot of people are very busy and they don't have time to engage in those kind of grassroots advocacy type things. So absent that, the only time their voice is really going to be heard is if they show up to the polls every two to four years. Um, So polling allows you to get a representative sample in the intervening Weeks and months in between big elections, you can continue to hear what people are saying and do so in a way that is theoretically, statistically pretty representative so that yeah. folks who are not the squeaky wheels can also be heard. How do you decide like what question to ask? One of the frustrations I have when I see a poll is the way the question is asked. And I'm like, man, there's a, there's a ton of nuance being missed there. Um, even even is something as simple as is the, is the, is the country going in the right or wrong direction? Right. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> And like, who are you asked? There's so much packed into that question. I, I find it to be such a useless poll, but, but and yet we still spend money and do it. And we ask those questions. I mean, I'm if we do polling, I micromanage that actually quite a bit. I'm like, I want to know, I want you to phrase it this way because I'm looking for a specific kind of response out of yeah. somebody to be useful to me. So the reason why some of these questions that are very vague still get asked is because one, it's a warm up. So when somebody is taking a survey, you're going to ask them a series of 15, 20, maybe 30 questions. Well, that's Depending. another question I have, which is the utility of, of doing that and like how to, and, and like what kind of what kind of voter pool does that really designate it? Because what kind of people are really willing to sit through 15, 20 questions? I'm not. I'll hang up. Well, and 15, 20 questions is honestly a short survey yeah, compared yeah, to a is. lot of ones that are out there. This is why, for me, the vast majority of polling I do is online. Because actually, 15, 20 questions online, you can rip through that pretty mm-hmm. quickly. Um, I will very frequently, this is like one of the number one, I don't want to say fights because it's not contentious, but 
uh, friction points I have with many of my clients is they have so many things they want to ask. So take what you just said about direction of country. Mm, see, I'd be you the opposite. Could, I'd be your opposite client. Oh, I'd you'd be, be like, yeah, I'd be, I'd be, yeah, I'd be doing, yeah, that's, well, that's always my they'll thing. They'll say, okay, uh, we can ask people, do you think the country is on the right track or the wrong track? But then let's ask why. And let's ask like five or six questions about why. Yeah, well, and then I do want, okay. You know, and that. so that's yeah. the trade off is like a short survey, you're going to lose fewer people at the same mm. time what are you missing in terms of asking those mm. other explanatory questions? That's the, the trade off. And then, and then how do you hire enough people to be able to interpret that explanation? Because so if I ask an open-ended question in a poll, you're going to get an open-ended answer and, or a rant or, or something. And so a good pollster has to hire very skilled callers to, to be able to, to kind of analyze that and, and translate that into a data. This is where AI, I think, has some potentially oh, really God, AI interesting. Is pull me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, not necessarily that AI will pull you, although that would also be yeah. a, yeah. certainly a, a yeah. thing that I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see this election cycle. Right. But the analysis on the back end, right? If right. I ask people, um, you know, do you approve or disapprove of the job the president is doing? And then I asked an open-ended why. Why do you mm -hmm. disapprove? I remember doing that in a survey I did about President Obama, and we just created a word cloud at the end. So not even the, like a really sophisticated AI analysis, just yeah. pump out yeah, the words. The word cloud. If you uh, disapproved of Obama, the number one word was economy. If you approved, the number one word was trying. Mm. He's trying. And so weird little things like that, you can kind of automate the analysis and yeah. still get something right. pretty interesting out yeah. of it. Yeah, and as a politician, I'd find that useful. Like I find those kind of things useful, um, diving into it. But I also am very aware of, of what people's attention spans are. Yeah. And then what is it, the kind of people who are willing to do that is that representative of the broader population? It's tough. It's a, it's a tough business. That's why I say it's in some ways miraculous that the polls in 2022 got it as right yeah. as they did. Because if you think about it, the type of person who has 15 minutes to take a poll is not your average person. Um, and so we have to put a lot of different things into place, too, to try to prevent kind of professional survey takers from dominating. Um, there are simple things you can do. Like you can ask questions about, say, government benefits. Which of the following do you benefit from? SNAP, et cetera. And anybody who checks like a multiple of them, that in reality is only like 0.1% of the population. So you can almost remove people who pick like a completely improbable pattern of things yeah. to just know, oh, that's just somebody who's randomly clicking through just stuff. Randomly, and so yeah. you can do a lot of data cleaning on the back Interesting. end. Well, um, how, do, how, how much do you like focus groups and, and do focus I groups? I love focus groups. So they're really old school. You know, there's yeah. nothing sort of fancy whiz bang, uh, you know, super data nerd about them. It's just sitting out in a room yeah. talking to people, but I love them. Yeah. I love them so much. It, it, for, and I guess that as a politician, we're, we kind of do focus groups all the time in a way, in a sense. Um, it, now, it, not totally because it's, it's people who come to us mostly. So it's... But, but if I go to a classroom, for instance, that, that in a way, that's an interesting focus yeah. group, seeing what kind of questions you get. So I, I like it. Um, uh, how often do you do it? How easy is it to, to get people to sign up for that? So focus groups are a little easier because you're, you're paying people and you're usually paying them a lot more than they're ever getting paid to take a survey. Yeah. Uh, so money talks, that helps. Um, but you're also, what I like about it is you're able to ask those follow-ups, those why questions. Right. And you can listen Expand to respondents that. talk to each other. Mm. So rather than just me as the pollster sort of forcing a question on someone, I can hear how respondent number one and respondent number two react to what respondent number three says. And like that can give me some insights as well into what are people really thinking? What Once you get beyond the initial, well, I think the country's on the wrong track. I worry about the border. You know, the things that right. you know, because you hear everybody say them a lot. How likely are you to vote for so-and-so? Very likely? Unlikely? <laughs> Un, 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 you know, it's like, oh my God, kill me right now <laughs> if I have to sit through this. Um, all right, so let's talk elections then. Um, since since the last time we spoke was before 2022. Uh, 2022, it is what it was. Um, I, I, yeah, I personally wasn't super surprised. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember my reactions at the time. I think, uh, you know, I knew we had some, I think, problematic candidates. But what's your what's your impression of that? Was it candidate quality? Was it just the maps weren't as nice as we thought they were? The the, the or was it the, the general vibe wasn't as good as we thought it was for Republicans? Yeah, so I, I kind of reject the idea that there's like a single unified theory. It would be so much easier for me to come on and be like, 
well, X is the reason why that it didn't turn out to be as good for Republicans as they had hoped. I think it was a mix of a couple of different things. I think the mood of the country was largely that it feels like we are unraveling. It feels like we are in a storm. It feels like things are falling apart. And I would like a steady set of hands on the wheel. And that normally would be something that would benefit the party out of power. If you feel like the people in charge, the control room is empty, oh no, um, you're going to want to change in leadership. You're going to want to put somebody else in power. And so you saw Republicans benefiting from that sense of anxiety, that sense of, you know, I want to change. There was really deep anxiety about the economy, Democrats really not being at all considered uh, effective on that issue. But then there were two things working against Republicans. The first was the issue of abortion, where suddenly something that had felt like kind of background noise or like an issue that people could put out of sight, out of mind, was very much front and yeah. center. And so even, Roe v. Wade was, yeah. I was overturned before that election. Yes, yeah, it was okay. overturned that Remind, summer. Reminding my own timeline. Um, yeah. And so it, it wound up, the question when the decision came down, I believe it was June 2022, was, well, is this something that's actually going to matter to voters by the time you get to November? Gas prices are so high, inflation is so big, mm-hmm. um, maybe people will have forgotten. And the answer was they hadn't. And you could see that most show up in the voter data where you had really high turnout among very young, particularly women, um, in key constituencies across the country. And so there really was, I think, a sense that that was a driver of Democratic based voters in a way that voters typically don't turn out to say thank you. That's why mm-hmm. in a midterm, you always have this back and forth where the party out of power suddenly, mm-hmm. their voters feel under siege, they feel like they've lost, and they feel like they need to go make a statement, while the party that's in power can kind of rest on its laurels. The overturning of Roe versus Wade inverted that whole dynamic, and suddenly Democrats felt like they were losing. They felt like mm-hmm. they were not in charge. And so it eliminated some of that. Mm. benefit Republicans would have had. The other thing Republicans did have, I think- I would say it's especially in states where they put it on the ballot because, you know, we didn't see that in Texas necessarily, the strictest abortion laws in the country. I don't, we didn't see any blue waves of any sort or even a stopping of the red waves. Um, But in Michigan, say, I I remember that they had it on the ballot in 2022. And then that's another story for Ohio more recently. Yeah. And and I think it's something that you're going to see in a lot of other states to the extent that there wasn't a plan to put it on the ballot. I think a lot of sort of Democratic operatives, progressive advocacy groups are going, "Um, let's put this on the ballot because we would very much like this to not fade as an issue. The other issue, you mentioned candidate quality, and, and that's kind of a euphemism for People are they? Do they seem within the mainstream? Do they seem? Yeah, they're nuts. I mean, like <laughs> we 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 had a few nutty candidates replace like you know your more moderate uh, GOP uh, incumbents. You had uh, we we elected two in two different states. Uh, our nominees were twenty five year olds. I mean, look so, look a twenty five year old could be amazing, right? They might have stormed the beaches of Normandy and then like opened a small business and had three kids by the age of twenty five. That's possible. Usually not the case though. Yeah, well, in, in an election where so many people were looking for that, I'm looking for a port in a storm, um, mm-hmm. you want to go with whoever feels the safest, whoever feels like you want them in the control room. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think some of the kind of chaotic vibes yeah. were really an especially big problem in 2022. You know, um, okay, so that makes a lot of sense. What, what is it about, I have, a, I have a couple questions and I'm not sure which one I want to ask first. Just want to make sure I don't forget either one of them, but one is on the abortion issue and young people on that. Um, and then, but, but then second is I, I think the, the consultant class, um, it's such a, a bigger conversation, but I just want to make sure I don't forget about it. This, this issue of the consultant class sort of creating this list of talking points that has, that has molded our electorate to such an extent. And I'm going to be curious about your point of view on that just from a polling and, 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 um, and focus group perspective, because, you know, I I always wonder from your perspective, how often you hear the same lines over and over and over again, you got to wonder, like, where'd you get that line from? Like, why are you saying it exactly the same as your neighbor? And you don't know, or or not neighbor, but other person who you don't know. Why? Whether you're on the left or the right, why? I think that's, it drives me crazy as a politician. I'm like, where's the script everybody's reading? Um, it's just talking points. And who built the talking points? Um, consultants. Why? Because they poll well. <laughs> so 
Um, this becomes this like self looking ice cream cone, uh, completely devoid of any philosophical, uh, actual foundation drives me nuts. Okay. But back to abortion, <laughs> another easy topic. So lack of philosophical, uh, the breaking apart of our philosophical foundations. That's one topic I want to dive in. And, but, but first abortion, both the easy ones. Um, how are we ever going to win this battle as a, as a, as a pro-lifer? I mean, am I ever going to convince young women that, that you should be pro-life and that, you know, this, this this isn't a reason to show up to the polls. So for a long time, there was not a big gender or generational divide on the issue of abortion. Um, back about 10 years ago, when I was writing my book all about younger voters and where there were gaps between the GOP and young people on certain social and cultural issues around religion, around, say, LGBT issues, there were gaps really beginning to emerge. But the data back then did not show a big difference between young and old men and women on abortion. And my theory at the time was that millennials at least were growing up in an era where ultrasound technology is so amazing and our ability to save the lives of premature babies who are born weeks and weeks and weeks before their due dates, that really science was actually helping to advance the pro-life cause by giving people a real look into how early humanity deserves protection. Um, what I think has kind of been lost in the plot, one is I think there was too much conflation with the question of birth control. Mm. I think that about eight, nine years ago around the Hobby Lobby decision really began to suddenly shift the conversation away from this question of life and more into what are the medical decisions I'm allowed to make and who's allowed to make them? And and I don't think that conservatives navigated that debate well. And I think that laid the foundation yeah. for a total lack of trust around these kind of questions about bodily autonomy, which I, as a, a pro-lifer, you say, well, this is about two bodies, right? There's the woman and there's the unborn child. And I would mm -hmm. like to protect both of them as much as possible. Right. And, um, but, but, I, but, I, but, their, but their response is, but you don't want me to have birth control. And I'm like, wait, what did you hear that? <laughs> right. And, and this was even, I, I, I wound up in a, a little bit of an kind of on-air kerfluffle about this a couple of months ago, because I believe the FDA announced that there was going to be some form of birth control that would be available over the counter. And I kind of made the point on air that actually nine years ago, it had been Republicans most pushing for this. And, yeah. you know, folks like Cory Gardner in Colorado, and it was actually the left who was opposed to it because they said, well, if you make it over the counter, then it takes it out of this insurance conversation. Uh, all of which is to say, like, there were some people back then trying to nudge the Republican Party yeah. into a like, let's turn the temperature down on this. Let's not be the party that's anti-birth control. But I do think that that planted an unhelpful seed that then allowed, when the Roe conversation came up, mm -hmm. the right was caught really flat-footed while the left knew we know exactly what to say right now. Yeah, that's, and, and the, other, the other thing about it is if you're pro-life, you're pro-life. It's, it's hard for me to philosophically be a 12-weeker. You know, now politically, I can understand that that's a different argument. Um, but from a moral standpoint, I can't be a 12 weeker because I, I can't intellectually explain to you why uh, a fetus in 12 weeks is somehow more valuable than 11 weeks and 10 weeks and et cetera. So that just logically, I can't get there. Um, now politically I get it though. And that's politically, that's where most people are 60. I'm assuming maybe that's still true and has been for a long time. 60, 70% of a, of a citizens believe that, uh, you shouldn't have a, an abortion past 12 weeks. And we've had trouble walking that line and being like, okay, so see, see, we agree with us more than you agree with Democrats because we don't really have like a national abortion stance. And so there might be some genius to Lindsey Graham trying to say, hey, we should have an actual Republican national um, stance on this. I think it was 15 weeks, but just, just to at least point to something and say, okay, states can, can, can litigate below that but, or, or legislate below that, but, but that's, the, that's at least the upper limit um, failing to do that, the left can make up what our position is. And well, and there was a, a midterm, or not a midterm, uh, the legislative elections in Virginia as well, just a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> that were, I think, touted by other political commentators as like, this is a test case around abortion. And the argument there was that Youngkin had tried to be very vocal around the mm -hmm. idea of like 15 weeks is where I would like this and this is what I would like to advance in the legislature. But the issue was 
so I live in the DC media market. Mm-hmm. I would turn on Sunday night football because there was an unbelievable amount of money going into these state legislative races. I was seeing yeah. ads on broadcast NBC Crazy. Um, about state legislative races. Um, but anytime it was an ad for the Democratic candidate, it was always talking about how the Republican was extreme on abortion and wanted to jail doctors. And when the Republican ad would run, it was always about how the Democrat was soft on crime. It was never... Nobody's addressing it, it each was other. Never, yeah, it was never, ah, the Republican is running an ad saying, no, actually, I have this position on abortion that is right in the median of where Virginia yeah. voters are. And that's fine. I, I probably, if I was advising them, I might not have advised them to do that in their yeah, ad. Yeah, but don't. the idea that somehow the fight in the minds of Virginia voters was around 15 weeks, I just don't 100%. This is an argument I always have if, if we do use, I don't know, I, I don't actually, I've never had a con- consultant's quote unquote, like, constantly on staff um you know i have a manager and then i have me and that's and because my complaint has always been you yes i understand that the that the basic uh advice given to a, to a candidate is just stick with basic talking points never really go into detail or address these arguments or counter arguments and i'm like that that, that, that is that's got to be old thinking it doesn't you've got to actually play tennis in the same court and, and respond directly <laughs> Um, in, in a tough race like this, you have to respond very directly and address what the other side's arguments are. People love hearing, and also it also gains traction online. People love hearing that, like, ooh, like the real truth um, kind of counter argument. This is what they're saying. This is what they're leaving out, and this is what the truth is. You know, I've kind of made my way doing that. It, it's, we don't have as many opportunities these days, um, but. Um, yeah, well, your works. comments there just lead back to the very first question you asked, which is about politicians kind of getting mm-hmm. this like mm-hmm. message discipline from on high, and why do they all suddenly sound like they're saying the same things, and where did this memo come from? Um, so on the one hand, I agree with you in that I think that there is some lazy thinking that circulates around in the political world, and... I don't want to point fingers, but there are there are some consultants that have sort of sold the idea that if you just have the right word or phrase, you can win any argument. That a voter who uh, believes A can be convinced of B if only you call it this instead of that. Yeah. You use this magic word. And like that's actually not how this works. Um, and so it leads to what I think is kind of lazy thinking of like, well, we don't really need the policy. We just need the message. Yeah. And I think voters' BS detectors are relatively turned on these days. Um, yeah. Now that doesn't mean that you know bad information online or nonsense that they see on the internet doesn't can't take hold, but that people kind of get politicians speak and they're looking for something that sounds different. I think voters are rewarding politicians that sound different. I think I think your average independent probably does. I've always I, 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 I fancy myself as having specialized in being able to swing that kind of voter. That was my old district though. Um, my, my new district's deep, deep red. And, and so this is, this is related to that question though, is uh, cause on both sides, um, consultants, if you're, if they're, especially since more and more seats are, are completely won in the primary election, that's where those talking points are getting silly and crazy and dangerous and stupid. And, and, and people's BS detectors are not there for them mm. in a primary and a primary election. The BS detectors don't work. That's, that's what I'm seeing. Um, and that's what scares me because it's 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 making both sides a little nuttier, if that makes sense. Well, and it's to the extent that people feel like they have to appeal to someone's kind of worst instincts. Yeah. I do think that that is it drives me nuts when consultants kind of take a lowest common denominator view of voters. I mean, yeah. I've I've seen this happen. I've done a focus group. And I walk back behind the glass and like the other consultants that are back. The consultants are like, like, okay, abolish the FBI. That's our thing now. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Like, well, because my question for the consultant too would be like, don't you fucking know better? Like, you you can't just abolish the FBI. You can't. That's insane. But you're going to advise a candidate who's too dumb to think for themselves. That's their fault. Sure. But they'll say what you tell them to say. Like, do you understand what kind of damage you're doing to our society and our party? You know, that's just one example. Abolish the FBI. It's like, okay, what are we? Are we uh, like against? We're, we're 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 back with AOC. Abolish the police. Like, what the hell, guys? Anyway, no, <laughs> but your 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 frustration is very justified. Here is my one attempt at a defense of message discipline. Like that sounds like a terrible phrase, but my defense of 
someone like me coming in, doing a focus group, and then coming to you as a candidate and saying, say X, not Y. My defense of this is that oftentimes people who think about this stuff day in and day out, you begin to talk in a language that is very comfortable Mm -hmm. and that you know exactly what you're trying to say. And that a voter hears you say it and like their brain goes somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so my job as somebody who is advising on messaging, if I'm doing my job right and I'm not being cynical and I'm not trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator, I'm just trying to act as a translator between someone who thinks about policy all day long and someone who does not have the luxury of thinking about policy all day long, is helping to make that communication. You know, the problem is we're getting more and more candidates smoother. who don't think about policy. Well, that's a, and that is a <laughs> whole separate big that's, problem. <laughs> that's actually how you end up in that problem. I yeah. just, I, I, you, what you're talking about is, is how I think politics has been normally for a long time, that relationship between candidates and consultants. Because the, in the ideal world of politics, what you actually have is these hyper-experienced like, policy wonks um, who run for Congress, but then have no idea how to talk about it, like in public, because this is their first time doing public stuff. It's the inverse now. Well, but here's my, uh, like let me pose a question to you to then. As someone who's a member of Congress, you are, you have an enormous amount of policy expertise, but do you feel like an expert in every subject that you have to vote on? Well, I am, of course, but <laughs> not everybody. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, of course not. Um, and in some parts, because government now does so much stuff, I actually yeah. feel sympathy for folks in elected office who are expected to have an answer on every single you, thing. You should have an answer, you know, and there's there's no excuse. You should have, and you should also be able, that answer can be, I'm not really sure. And I think people and, need and, to avail themselves of that answer a lot more often. Yeah, like if you ask me a, a complicated answer about kind of banking regulations, like I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is my answer. I'm going to be like, I'm not on the financial services committee, um, but here's how I kind of generally view this you know, from a philosophical standpoint. The problem is not most, a lot can't even do that. And the ones who can aren't appreciated for it, really. Um, yeah. They're the ones doing all the work up here, but really not appreciated for it. And I'm, I'm seeing very different classes of candidates run for whatever seat it is these days. And it's, again, it's exactly the inverse. It used to be this idea that it's like, okay, people like you have to come in and like humanize the, the, the smart whatever business owner who actually does know things, but like doesn't, you know, they would talk about it in a certain way and you'd be like, ah, you got to talk about it this way and then it'll make more sense to people. Th- that's fine. That's classic. Like we make, we've seen movies about it. That's not how it is anymore. Um, it's like, say what Twitter said, say what Twitter wants you to say. Sorry, it's X now, whatever. It's still stupid. And, <laughs> and say whatever they want you to say. And that's like, man, that's like 10% of the population. Maybe, yeah, maybe slightly higher. If we're talking about primary voters, but I'm seeing this language start to unfold from it and, and that, that, that both the consultants, candidates, and voters themselves all share, like it's a script. And I'm like, is anybody, think, is anybody making words on their own? Is anybody doing original things? I'm not so sure. This drives me crazy. And it's, it's a big battle I fight. And you know, what it leads to is populism. That's what it leads to because populism makes its, it, 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 is, it is almost defined by these emotional outbursts um, that are kind of meaningless. And just and just and just and they gain val they, they they gain their authority by repetition. That's scary. So, well, I think your point on people being too too online is very 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 important to understanding where I think a lot of our communications breakdown is happening. I think if you want to look at some of the candidates that failed in twenty twenty two, candidates that are struggling in twenty twenty four, not naming any names, but the more kind of painfully online you are, it used to be that people would say, oh, it's good to be more engaged online. Got to go where the voters are. But there's now become this total disconnect where people are so eager to court kind of online engagement Mm -hmm. that they forget that that is, you know, the only, what, 10%, that like 90% of political tweets are made by like some unbelievably vanishingly small proportion yeah. of users. Yeah, well, a lot of these, like, young 20-somethings run, like, 15 different accounts. They, they retweet each other. It's all in echoes. Like, I know, I've known this for a long time, but I don't think normal people know this. They think it's just yet another organic-made meme account. Like, no, this is, there's money. They, they, they are selling ads from the same people. A lot of it are bots. Like, there's a whole industry there. And people will tell you, this is another one of those interesting, the difference between surveys and focus groups. If 
I do a survey and I'm like, do you trust the things that you read online? People will be like, no, absolutely not. And then you can do a focus group and you get like 30 minutes into the group and somebody says something that you know is wrong. And you're like, tell me a little, you know, as a moderator, I always have to keep good poker face. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tell me a little bit more about where you heard that. And they'll be like, oh, I saw it on, you know, name your uh, yeah, tech Some weird news site. I had to go to that news site because all the other ones are wrong. Right. Um, <laughs> and it's just, it's so funny that somebody, you know, 20 minutes earlier would have said, oh, I don't trust anything I read online. I do my own research. I do my and yet they have outsourced the I do my own research to yeah. whatever, whatever, whatever dot com. Um, but, but at the same time, someone who says, I don't trust a mainstream media source, therefore I went to whatever, whatever, whatever dot com, I have some sympathy for. Yeah. The, the void that they feel they are living in where they don't feel like they can trust anything yeah. they see. Now they see a few things that are you know clearly wrong from mainstream media, but then they, our, our society's problem is inability to, to discern, you know, what makes sense and what doesn't. Yeah. No, not everyone is telling you the truth all the time and some are telling you the truth less time than others. Is that You know what? So what do you do in that world? I mean, you got to put on your thinking cap <laughs> and you got to, and, and, and you've got to be able to have some assessment of, of, Jeez, I don't know. I mean, because I always joke that I see it in my comment section, like um, whatever post and whatever commenter says, well, I mean, Dan's a globalist rhino, you know, he works for George Soros. Next commenter, oh my God, I loved him. Like I've been following him for years. I can't believe that, but thanks for telling me. And it's like, but that's the same kind of person who's like, I never believe anything I read online. But they believe, they they view that as a peer in a way. And now you can get them back because you can say, well, no, that's not true. That's a troll. You know, that's what trolls are. Um, But it's exhausting and uh, you know, un- un- unclear what to do about that. And it's so that, that, yeah, that echo chamber in the, in the online world is, is, is nuts. Let's, let's reverse back to what you think of current um, election trends post 2022 election. It was like a ton of momentum around DeSantis and it's clearly very not the case now. So it was a pollster. What's your take on that? So my, uh, my explanation of this involves uh, a reference to, that anybody who plays video games will probably understand. Do you play video games at all? I mean, I grew up playing video games. I don't know. Do the reference to see if I can. Okay. Well, so basically that in any, in a lot of games these days, uh, you fight a boss, the big Mm. enemy at the end of the game. And sometimes that boss will have shields up and you can throw everything at him. doesn't matter. Yeah. But then there will come a moment in the fight where they make a gesture, like the shields go down, mm-hmm. and that's when all of your stuff can stick. Yeah. There was a moment after the 2022 midterms when the shields were down. Yeah. The former leader of our party. Yeah. Um, and people were going- <laughs> Do you want to name him? <laughs> Trump, yeah. Donald Trump's shields were down. Yeah. And there was a real questioning of like, ooh, are we sure this is the path we want to go down? And people were really questioning whether he was electable, whether that was the right path. And I think the problem was the shields went back up before anyone took a shot at him. Mm-hmm. Um, that this question of... Would you advise, like, if, if, if DeSantis could go back in time, is there things he could have done differently? I, I think if, if you could get in a time machine, don't wait for the... I mean, I, I, the, waited, the rationale yeah. was, I'm going to wait for my state legislature to do a bunch of stuff... I'm going to not let the noise of a presidential campaign get involved. Right. And then I'll be able I also to say. Think, I think he probably felt very comfortable too. Yeah. Well, it, it didn't seem at that time that there was really any other alternative. Everybody else was polling four or 5%. Yeah. Um, and th- so there was really a moment when you asked Republican voters head to head, Ron DeSantis versus Donald Trump. And it was a competitive, right. interesting race. And as the year went on, that's how do you how explain hard. that voter that said DeSantis, but has clearly said now Trump? Uh, like, what did DeSantis do to, uh, and what did Trump do? They're both the, the, everything's still the same. So I, I, I'm just curious what, so what I'll, changed those voters. I'll, I'll use another analogy, and this is I, I've used this to try to describe voters who, in surveys, say that they like Donald Trump, but they're open to considering other alternatives. Because those are the core folks, right? There's always been about 20, 30 percent of the party that says. Absolutely not. We need a new direction. Mm -hmm. And always about 35% of the party that's like, I'm with Trump and I have been since the beginning. But it's the rest of those folks that I think are the most interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think early on, think about someone whose favorite food is meatloaf. The restaurant down the block makes meatloaf that they know they like. It's not for everyone. It's not everyone's favorite food. It's their thing. And they're really hungry. 
and they want to eat something that they know they're going to like. So they walk into the restaurant and the waiter goes, do you want to hear the specials today? These are people who are like, maybe I'll hear the specials. I'll hear specials. Okay. Yeah, I got you it. You can tell yeah. me. <laughs> but in the end, they're going to order the meatloaf because they're really hungry and they don't want to take a risk on something. And so even though people who don't like Donald Trump will often say he's this like risky chaos guy, for a lot of those kind of middle of the road Republicans, yeah, Donald Trump has baggage. Yeah, he seems chaotic, but I know what I'm getting with him. He's comfortable. I know exactly how this is going to go. I know he's going to take positions I like on immigration or trade or the economy or crime and gosh, we really need that. And in a way, candidates that I might think of as more kind of conventional or safe, someone like a Ron DeSantis, hey, he's going to have all these conservative principles, but none of the baggage. Or a Nikki Haley, hey, we've she's got a track record as governor from South Carolina. Yeah. You may think of them as safe, but to actually a lot of Republican voters, and I've, I've heard this in these focus groups I do for the New York Times where they let me talk to Republican primary voters, mm -hmm. they run the transcripts, is a lot of these voters actually feel like Trump is the safer bet. And when you look at these polls where you say- What do we mean by safe? Like what is safe? Can beat Joe Biden. It, it, that's interesting. Well, it's a it's mostly can beat Joe Biden, and so that's I, I get I get just liking him and have loyalty and the policy mm -hmm. you know safety as far as I know what he's going to do and how he's going to act. Um, he's always been very transparent about that. So yeah, but from that from that perspective, I understand the word safe. But like, but people really think he's going to beat Biden. This is where I'm concerned. But of course, it's not impossible. It's that was going to be impossible. my next. I was going to be my next question. Yeah, as as I mean, and, and that's why I think back in the spring or back about a year ago. A lot of Republican voters did not think that Donald Trump was a safe bet to beat Joe Biden. Yeah. And they were like, ooh, we do need a new direction. But as the year went on, I think you began to see more and more polls come out showing the voters really don't like Joe Biden right now. They're yeah. really disappointed in him. And therefore, when you ask this Trump versus Biden matchup, people go, well, that sounds like the rematch from hell, but I guess, like, flip a coin, you know? And, and because Trump has run so competitively with Biden in these polls, it really kind of undercut any mm -hmm. electability argument that someone like Ron DeSantis well, those are more recent, And those are more recent, too, so it's really solidified. Because it... Right? Am I wrong about that? I, I, it, some of those polls are a little bit more recent that showed because they certainly changed my mind. Um, but those are the recent New York Times polls. In yeah, well, and, and there's also, you know, there was a poll that CBS did in the summer that this is when it really dawned on me like, oh, I think of Trump as less electable than DeSantis or Haley, and Republican voters don't think that. Is they asked these primary voters, do you think that Donald Trump would definitely beat Joe Biden, probably beat Joe Biden, mm -hmm. might not beat Joe Biden? And Donald Trump, it was like 61% of Republican voters said, oh, he'll definitely. Uh, no problem. I no think problem. It, I, I, I shouldn't have quoted an exact number because now I'm like, it was it 61? Yeah. It was something. But it was it's very intuitive. High. I, I'm, it was I'm very sure that's high. true because that's kind of what I, how I sense it as well as far as the opinions but they were, go. It was not 61% saying that for Haley or for DeSantis. And even though, even though the, by the numbers, like Haley would blow him out of the water. Like, right. Isn't, yes. Isn't we now that, have tons of evidence of that. Yeah. And, but I, I also think it's important to remember that even though you and I think of someone like Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, and all these folks as like pretty well defined, we know what they stand for. They've been running for president. We, we have seen a lot yeah, of them. But we pay attention to politics constantly, so we're in a different right. category. In these New York Times focus groups, when I go through and I do the exercise of like, give me a word to describe Ron DeSantis, in a room of like 11 faces, there'll be three or four that are like, I don't really know enough about the guy to give you a word. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. That's I wild. Was, I mean, I, I, hey, thought he was so busy, famous. Yeah. yeah. And, and thought there was so much on him, but we're in political world all the time. Yeah. So our, our, our views are a little skewed on that. And, and Trump has had hundred percent name ID for 40 years. <laughs> it's, but so like yeah. it's, 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 nobody else <laughs> has had that except maybe George Washington. Um, but even then probably not <laughs> honestly. Um, okay. Well, but what's the real, so, so at least he, he the primary is, kind of over at this point is it or I'm, is it the only reason i'm not saying it's over is because i think the polling that i have seen in new hampshire is uh i think the scientific word for it is spicy it's like, interesting it's kind of interesting um you've got you know iowa looks to be a pretty done deal and the way i was describing this recently was that it's like the 2000 campaign we have iowa we're like the juggernaut of george, at that time george w bush mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, he's going to win Iowa. And then you get to New Hampshire. And because New Hampshire has independence as such a big piece of the puzzle, yeah. things can get real squirrely there, right. real interesting. 
But then you head to South Carolina. And the big question will be, is South Carolina, because, say, Nikki Haley's from there, does that is that like a wild card that makes it play out mm-hmm. differently than 2000, where you had the juggernaut get surprised, you know, oh, we lost to New Hampshire, but then they clamp down and they take the threat seriously and they win the rest of the way. So I think Trump is like a 90% chance to win the Republican primary, but I don't give it 100. Yeah. Because I don't give anything 100% chance no. anymore. No, no, not after the, the interesting political <laughs> moments we've seen. And then the general election comes along. So, you know, it's competitive now. My worry is, of course, um, there's these things called ads and those ads yeah. are going to show January 6th over and over and over and over again and make that very clear. Um, you know, how much can, how much can Republicans really lose? Cause I, I, in my opinion, I'm really curious what yours is. I would, I would just throw out like 5%, a 5% part of, of that Republican base is just not going to vote for Trump again. They might stay home. They might not vote for a Democrat, but I think they'll never vote for Trump again based on just the, the actions post January 6th. Um, what do you think of that? And, but the question is, is that neutralized by the fact that Democrats just aren't excited to come out and vote for Biden either? So negative emotion is very, very, very powerful. And again, voters don't turn out to say thank you, but they will turn out to vote to stop something that they think is very bad and scary. And so right now, it's very easy for, say, young progressives to take a poll where they say, well, I'm not voting for Joe Biden because I don't like his position on X, mm. Y, or Z. I don't think he's done enough on climate. I don't like yeah. what he's saying about the Middle He's East. supporting Israel, which is a whole other crazy... Well, that's a whole crazy, separate Yeah, that's thing. another hour conversation about where but the left the is. at the end of the day, do those young progressives actually stay home? Do they actually like vote for Cornell West or something? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think in the end, negative partisanship is a really, really, really strong drug and that people will ultimately hold their nose and go... I think this one guy's better than the other. And I think you'll see a lot of people do the same thing with Trump too, that right now they yeah. may say, I that think he's 5%, Even that 5%. That's why I, it's a small number, yeah. 5%, but it's still like, it's maybe, because there's still 95% that are, there's still plenty of other people that are like, no, I don't like him, but I'm going to vote for him. Yeah. You know, and, and so, and then there's, but he's, and, and Trump has another advantage, which is just that animus, you know, that, that sort of ability to, um, to mobilize his, yeah. his base that well, Biden doesn't have. The other big question is what will turnout look like, which is such a political cliche. It all comes down to turnout. But it really, I mean, in this election, mm-hmm. I do believe that there is a, uh, not non-existent, but relatively small group of people who are kind of persuadable. Maybe they really don't know how they feel between Trump and Biden. But for a lot of people, they know which of those two they prefer. The question is just, do I bother voting or not? Yeah. Um, and it used to be that Republicans had the very reliable coalition, and it was Democrats who really had to drag their voters to the polls. In the last decade or so, especially in the Trump era, that has been inverted. That's why, mm-hmm. partially, why Democrats do so well in these like off, off, off year, yeah. local referenda, you know, what have you, is that their coalition now includes more of the kind of people who vote and vote all the time, every time there's an election. Where Republicans' coalition now includes more of these people who are like loosely attached to politics. They will maybe tune into the political news a week or so before the election. Like Trump did grow the Republican coalition in in that direction, like lost some voters but gained some others. Mm-hmm. And so for Republicans, you we now have that turnout question that's a little bit, this wasn't as much of an issue 10 years ago. Um, so in a high turnout election, it used to be the Democrats thought, oh, the more we vote, the better we do. But actually for Republicans now, high turnout is a good thing. That's why I am such a big advocate for anybody who says, oh, we need to like, like don't, tell your voters not to vote mail in or don't vote early. We can have plenty of debates about like the best way to execute our elections, yeah. but with the rules on the books, you do not want to be discouraging anybody from participating yeah. through whatever legal means are necessary or available to them in their state. And Republicans really are going to rely on some of those lower turnout voters if they want to get across the finish line. Yeah. In the suburbs. I mean, suburbs of Philadelphia, Atlanta, are those going to shift? Uh, because right now they were, they were not friendly to, to Trump or MAGA. I mean, my sense is that the Democrats keep using the words ultra MAGA for a reason, like yeah. because it, it pulls badly with independence. It, it leans into that sense of extremism. If you are a sort of normal middle of the road suburban voter, 
you don't want to have to think about politics every day. And so the more that there is that chaos and that turn and that sense that the control room is empty, you don't like that. Um, Joe Biden was supposed to, he sold himself to those voters as I'm going to be this steady hand, this stable force. And then it has not really felt like the control room has been yeah. full of the best and brightest right. over the last couple of years. So a lot of those voters are going, okay, well, that, that experiment maybe didn't work, right. but do I really think that putting like a Trump 2.0 yeah. with an agenda of like maybe he's dressing for revenge, you know, on the on the menu? I I, ooh, I don't know about that. Um, and so for those voters, it's going to be a clash between, on the one hand, them trusting Republicans much more on the economy, immigration, mm -hmm. crime, and those things that they feel have spiraled out of control on Democrats' watch. Yeah, but for Republicans, it is. Will you make things worse with this? It's an image problem. Yeah. You know, undermining rule of law, you know, the January 6th ads that you said they're going to yeah. run. And then you add abortion into that as well of, you know, you think things are in control and stable, but Republicans, they'll run roughshod over yeah. you. And that's where right. suddenly it's, we're going to have two candidates people don't like competing for voters who are looking for normalcy. And I don't think they're going to find it. Yeah, it's frustrating because I think Democrats are so easy to beat. Um, yep. And I think the polling uh, suggests that that's true. Uh, and yet we find ourselves potentially still not winning, but we'll see. Um, we'll see. So we, we could talk a lot more. Maybe we need to do another episode one day on like how, how opinions within each party have changed and yeah. how like the platforms of each party have changed. And, you know, right now you're seeing it with, with the sort of anti-Israel, because crazy anti-Israel sentiment in the Democrat party, especially in the younger ones. And then on, on the right, you know, the, the advent of populism. And, you know, I don't think I was battling the populace as much as I am, as I constantly do these days when last time we spoke. And so, you know, that's a, maybe a whole other interesting conversation, but we've, we've, we've both got a heart out right now. So, um, Kristen, thanks so much for being on. Thank you for having me.